Hello, welcome to Mansfield's Money Sense. Nice to have you with us once again. Um, I was reading a report the other day from Old Mutual Actuaries and Consultants. Now, okay, hang on, let's, let's stop it right there because, uh, fine. I just want to explain something to you, okay? I've been doing television work for over 20 years. Let me explain, if camera three, come in here, show that you see that there, okay? That's called an earpiece. Basically, what that thing does is it's linked all the way into the back studio where the producer and all the, the staff are. And that way, the producer can talk to me and he can tell me what he needs and what he wants and where he's going and all the rest of it, which is why I sometimes look at you fairly blankly because he's talking to me. As I said, the other day I was reading a report from Old Mutual Actuaries and Consultants. I heard everybody in the back room start laughing. I can read. I do read, okay? Marius is now saying to me, yes, your wife was reading it to you, wasn't she? No, she wasn't, Marius, just for your information. According to Old Mutual Actuaries and Consultants, only half of South Africans in formal employment belong to a retirement fund. We wanted to look at this and uh, look at the ramifications of it. So we asked uh, Harry Boerter, who's a research analyst at AVL Research, and Scott Milan, who's executive director actuarial at BrightRock, to join us. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Nice to have you with us. Um, th 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 those numbers don't sound very lacquer, Harry. They no, sound scary. No, exactly, they do. So there, there is quite a big gap, and you can see it uh, specifically if you look at those, uh, if that data, and also a survey compiled by Finscope, you can also see that there's quite a big gap in terms of um, people saving for retirement and people uh, wanting to save for retirement and that don't. The numbers stuck, if I recall correctly, somebody was saying a few shows back, is only about 16 or 15 or 16 percent of GDP is actually being put into retirement savings. Yes, Jeremy, uh, I think that's, uh, that is correct. And, uh, I mean, look, um, there, are, there are multiple areas where, where individuals are, are not funding for what they need. Mm. I mean, if you look, for example, on the life insurance front as well, there's also a significant gap um, that, that exists between what individuals need and what they actually um, have in place. So, so yeah, it is a trend that's, that's existing in the life insurance industry and, and also obviously in the pension fund industry that we need to... Where, where is this trending? Is it, is it trending upwards? I mean, are, are people starting to save or are people saving less? Or is it, are we flatlining on this particular issue? Yeah, I mean, it, it is improving. And uh, if you look at stats of, over the last 10 years, um, the number of people saving for retirement and the amount they're saving for retirement uh, is increasing, but it's, it's a fairly slow trend. It's nothing that's gonna change uh, very quickly. And I think it, it is because it's a, a key uh, reason for that is probably education. And that t takes a while to kind of uh, come through. Okay. Having established where the numbers are here, um, what, what should we be looking at? I mean, where, where are people getting involved? The ones that are saving for retirement, are they going into life insurance? Are they going into unit trusts? Are they, where, where's the money going? Well, Jeremy, I think uh, the money that is being spent, a significant portion of that is going into your life insurance vehicles um, today. Although there is a growing trend of individuals actually going directly um, through intermediaries or even themselves into unit trusts directly as well. So that's, that's definitely, I think, a trend of more and more people moving into, um, into vehicles that are trading directly into that unit trust, into that share. I mean, if you think about it, a number of the banks also facilitate and open up um, share portfolios that individuals can invest directly. So it's becoming more accessible. Um, but it's like uh, uh, Harry was saying, it's, it's more accessible for, um, due to increase in education, but that's still a long way to go. The, the, the the unit trusts and all the rest of it um, that Scott's referring to here, I would imagine that a lot of people are going into those because of the, the cost involved or the, the, the savings on the cost. Where, what are you looking at? Um, I don't know if either of you can give me a, 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 baseball, a base figure here, but what, what are we looking at in costs in life insurance now? I mean, what sort of percentage are you looking at in brokerage? Scott, yeah? Well, I mean, it, it ranges. I mean, what, what, what I think the industry has, uh, has increased uh, their, uh, their ability a lot to, to communicate these expenses. They um, use what they call a, a total expense ratio these days, Jeremy. And, and these total expense oh, ratios... Yeah, you see, here comes the jargon now. A total expense ratio, a TER. What's I'm, my TER? And I'm going to try and explain <laughs> that to you today. And, and what the TER says, yes. if I can, um, is trying to quantify all the expenses. Now, that would include your commissions 
your actual administration costs, your performance fees, all of that into um, one number that is really the impact of that um, having on your total investment. So for example, if you have a total expense ratio of 1%, just uh, as um, for, for um, explanation, and your total investment return is 10% before any fees, you would expect a 9% return on your investment. Okay. So that number, I think, is, is, is now created a lot more clarity on what the, what the costs are. And I think it varies, Jeremy. I think you, you'll find between um, going directly um, or through intermediary, it goes between 1.35%, more or less there, just over 1%, all the way to 4, 5, 6% as well. So you get quite a big range still. It depends on what vehicle you're using, depends on um, what type of investment you are going. For example, if you're going to a more conservative type of investment, that will be typically a lower, lower type of expense. If you go to what they call these tracker type of portfolios, where it's simply a passive investment where they track, for example, the top 40 shares in, on, the, on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that will typically attract a lower expense. But if you go to a very active managed portfolio, um, that's going to cost, will, it's will, will, cost, you, will more. cost you more. But hopefully, um, the return that you'll get will be will be commensurate with with that in terms of the higher cost that you pay. So so there's a big range, um, and and I think it's important that consumers when they when they um, go through the options available, um, look at the various options on the table. Especially, I think uh, the role of the advisors they're critical to point out what is the aim of this investment. Is it for for shorter term? For um, planning is it for for long-term planning in terms of your retirement or even beyond that, um, and th and that strategy should be based on what your needs are. But are are people actively doing that? Because in my mind, when I think about somebody who's saving for retirement, they generally and I may be wrong here. Maybe you can enlighten me. They generally are, are doing it through one vehicle. You know, they're not saying, okay, I'm going to take thirty percent and I'm going to go conservative, I'm going to take another 30%, it's going to be fairly aggressive, and then I'm taking another 30%, and I'm going to say, hammer this one because I hope to make a profit. Are, are we still passive people when it comes to, to these sort of investments? Well, I think that's where the financial plan or financial advisor is very important in order to guide the individual in terms of uh, what kind of allocation they need uh, in terms of their retirement savings. So. Um, yeah, I mean, as an example, if you're a very young individual, you'd probably have a lot of exposure to um, equities or shares, for example. Uh, whereas if you're older and closer to retirement, it would be more towards uh, more secure and uh, more stable funds like bonds or, or money market funds. But do people get involved in those sort of decisions? I mean, you know, m companies have retirement funds. Um, what's the interface between the actual person? And the company's board of trustees with the, the financial institution that's administering them. Uh, are, are we aggressive enough in looking after what we actually should be getting at the end of the day? Sure. I mean, um, I think to a certain extent regulations have helped there. So specifically for individuals, um, the FSB is now required that 70% uh, uh, that, or put a maximum on the amount of equity exposure at 70%. Um, they've also um, then put minimums on effectively on bond and money market exposure. So um, to a certain extent there is uh, some, I guess, um, guidance uh, in terms of what allocation you have. But um, yeah, I can't speak for specifically for specific companies, so um, how they approach uh, dealing with their employees and their um, allocations. Last year, um, the Ombudsman for Long-Term Insurance reported an increase of over 8% in uh, complaints. Is that because more people are saving? Is it because in terms of the FSB, there has to be this disclosure that you can complain? Is that possibly one of the reasons? Jeremy, I think it's driven by, by everything that you've said, but to, but to uh, I think, drill in a little bit more detail, I, I think definitely um, consumers are becoming more aware. I think information is becoming more available um, and, and, and the ability to discern what, um, what is right and what's not right in terms of what I've selected and what I'm expecting is becoming much more uh, um, of, a, of, a, of a factor. I think uh, where, where those uh, ombudsman claims are, are always indicative, increasing, that's actually uh, it's a positive thing. I think it's, it's, mm. it shows that, that consumers are much more aware. It will, it, it's good for competition. It's good for the industry. And it means that service is being, being utilized appropriately so so yeah uh, it's 
it's a good it's a good thing for for, for both sides of, of the of the, the coin absolutely I think uh, um, if, if, if we can have more consumers and I think that's a good um, um, assessment of whether consumers are becoming to understand what the investments are doing and what they're not what what they're not delivering um, like you asked earlier do people take control of, of their own destiny and I think that is a indi indica indicator that it is definitely um, a, a trend that's growing I think what obviously needs to be monitored carefully is that that trend is not continuing to go up that that's actually and and what's also obviously always important to understand from the ombudsman side is what are those complaints what were they because if you look at the life insurance industry as, as, as another example where, where that's quite a statistic that's tracked quite carefully is it's often um, the, the the matching between expectation of the initial contract and what's actually being delivered and and you, what often happens is those ombudsman claims are, are in favour of, let's say, the product provider, but that might not um, be what the expectation of the client is. And yeah, because I suppose it depends on where in the cycle you are, to be honest, because if, you, if you're in the cycle right now and your expectation was you're going to be earning, let's say, 8%, uh, the chances are you, you're not earning that 8% right now. And people have got to understand that. No, exactly. So... I mean, actually, again, that's probably where it is important to have very good relationship with your clients and possibly that through a financial advisor or, um, I guess, uh, companies are becoming more proactive in terms of communicating through websites, social media, things like that um, mm -hmm. with their clients. And, and, and I can maybe add to that. I mean, I think w if, you, if you look at uh, a few years back where projections were sh illustrated of, of, of fund values, so, so that was always perceived as that's actually what I'm actually going to be getting. Um, and the reality is that it wasn't. It was always intended for a projection. But I think where the code on how to quote, how to provide information to consumers have changed significantly. Where guys are seeing a, um, a projection, but it's very clear that it's purely an indicative. It's based on a certain growth rate that's been assumed. Rather look at your total expense ratio and perhaps the track record of that specific investment that you have. Okay, well where, let's the, where the advisor is then absolutely key to, to, to make that, uh, provide that support. Let's, let's get on to that um, in the second part of the show because we've been sort of looking at it from a more general point of view. Let's start drilling down into this now and finding out what you should be looking for when you're looking into these sort of investments. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment.